Y'all already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life, and we're back. My life, volume two. Before we get anywhere, man. Before we get started, it took a lot to get to where I'm at today. It took a lot of growth. It took a lot of just everything you can imagine, man. A lot of soul searching. A lot of correcting. A lot of changing the way I think, rethinking, retraining. So when I tell you all these stories, just take into consideration, these are all the things I did and went through to, to get to who I am. Some people go through life and they don't have to do all that. They just get it from the gate. They have that proper upbringing, that good environment. And then for some people, they have that and it still doesn't matter. For me, I don't know if it matters. I just know that I have become so accustomed to doing what I was doing that led me to the point that now the police are there. I'm in Philadelphia. I'm on the run. They've ran up in the crib. It's off to prison. I know I'm done. When they come states over to get you, they've got U.S. Marshal, fugitive, you know, fugitive task force, Philadelphia police involved, Richmond City, Chesterfield police involved. It's bad. We're going to get back into parts. Now, before we start, the Hummer comes out to shop today. Happy about that. It's all done. Uh, pretty expensive process, but with having insurance, I only had to pay $500. That's why you stay on your grown-up shit, pay your bills. I know insurance is just in case stuff happens, but stuff happens. And when it happens, it's good to have it. My brother is doing good. We did go to Bush Gardens. Um, throw a couple, you know, pictures in real quick. We had a blast. I took him on a weekday. That way it wouldn't be overcrowded. I know how it is to be freshly released and around too many people. The anxiety, the PTSD, the, you know, where you just came from comes into play. And it doesn't, it just, it, it goes, it starts feeling more like a problem than it does something you enjoy. And so it's hard for y'all to understand that. But people that have been locked up understand what I'm saying. When you spent that much time in a box in confinement, in prison, being around a lot of people like that can be a shock. It can be scary. It can almost make you feel like you don't have control of the situation. And the last thing you ever want while you're locked up is not to have control of a situation. When you don't have control of the situation, then the situation starts to control you. That works in life as well. I try to stay in control of situations. And when I'm not, I don't I don't know what to do. But yeah, he's doing good. Doing great. My little boy had a blast. I don't think he'll be wanting to go through. No haunted houses, no time soon. But anyway, my life part two. Y'all know how to seen it. You know how to lived it. So let's relive it. So where we left off at, pretty much picked up from when I was 17 up until 24. By now, I had a, a relationship most of that time. Was done wrong, did everything else wrong in it. It was a piece of shit. I didn't have a kid. I spent more time from the age of 17 to 24 locked up than I had in the streets. My time in the streets were just hectic. I didn't care about life. I didn't care about tomorrow. I didn't care about living. None of that played, you know, nothing to do with my day-to-day -day life. They run up in the crib that morning in southwest Philly. We're off Greenway, and they come in. Like I told y'all, they do that knock. That you know is only the police. Before I know it, they're all in the, in the house. Guns out, mask on, everybody on the floor. There's a bunch of different people in this place. I go straight in the cuffs. When they come through the door, I knew who it was when I heard that knock. There's no mistake in that knock. If you've had that knock before, you know that knock. I'm sitting there. I got this 40 sitting on the table. I got this half-eaten sandwich on the table. I got this blunt I'm smoking in between hitting this 40 and eating a sandwich. Bright and early in the morning. They come to the door. All I can do is look over at them, hit the blunt, put it in the ashtray, and lay down. Blunt's still burning their handcuffing me. They get me up, 
Get me somewhat dressed, put my pants on, I step into my Tim's. Got a wife beater on. They go upstairs, they get Brian, bring him down. They think the dude that answered the door, they think initially that he's Brian. They think he's Philly, right? They realize he's not. They clear the house. They bring us both out in handcuffs, right? They hadn't searched me at this point, and I am standing there, and I got a pocket full of PCP, filed up, ready to be sold. And I'm telling the dude, I'm telling the cop that's got me, just standing outside as they're, you know, just doing what they're doing. They're on the phones, letting the people back in Virginia know they've got us in custody, asking them questions. And I'm like, yo, I got to piss, man. I got to piss real bad. And the cop was like, well, you can hold it. I was like, well, I'm going to piss in the cop car or the van or whatever you put me in. You might want to let me piss. Well, you're not going back in the park. I can piss right here, man. I'm standing in an alleyway. Let me piss. Well, we stayed at the people next to us had a, you know, a dog cage out back. Like their backyard was, and you know, I know how Philly backyards is. It's either an alleyway. If you do have a backyard, it's just a concrete slab with a little fence around it. I got this tall ass fence with this pit bull in there, so... And this dog was vicious. Like, dudes would... We'd be out there smoking and shit. Dudes would touch the fence and the dog would go crazy. These Cambodian people live there. The dog was like the security system for their house. The cops like, go ahead, piss. I'm like, well, you gonna unzip me and hold it for me? Because I can't exactly pull this out and piss with my hands handcuffed, right? So he's like, all right, all right. So he uncuffs me. I'm not going nowhere. I got cops everywhere. There's nowhere to go to the left. It's a dead end and a wall. The only way I can run is back through the alleyway. I told you we lived in an alleyway and then there was our apartment. So he uncuffs me. I'm standing there and he's talking to some more people, to the other cops and the U.S. Marshals and all these different organizations that have showed up. And as he's talking, I'm pissing. I reach in my pocket. I grab these vials and I throw them through the fence. Now they're inside there with this pit bull. He looks, oh, you think you're slick? You think you're slick? Puts me in cuffs. Like, hurry up and puts my cuffs back on me. He's looking at the vials. And y'all can believe this. Don't believe it. It doesn't matter. The damn dog was eating the vials. The dog was licking these things up off the ground and swallowing them. Hope the dog's okay. Not into hurting animals, but I had to get this shit up off me. Fast as I threw him on the ground, dog is slapping these things up. And that wouldn't be the first time I'd had a dog eat my drugs. Like, it had happened before during another raid, right? They walk us out this alleyway and onto the main street on the greenway. And I look down this way and they've got the street blocked off. I look down this way, they've got the street blocked off. There's nobody outside, nobody coming out of stores or housing. They've already told everybody to stay in the house until they get us apprehended. Straight into the back of a paddy wagon we go. They throw me and Brian in the back. They serve us with our indictments right in and there. Give us all our our charges. Take us into custody. Off to the district we go. We don't sit in the district like we usually would. Like usually you sit there 72 hours to see if you can make bond. We go to the district and I think we're there about a day, maybe two days where 55th and Pine. As soon as I go in front of the judge, $100,000 bail with a detainer. A detainer means even if I make bail, I can't get out. they got a hold on me. Go to CSCF, one of the main correctional facilities in Philly, out off State Road. Sit there the next couple months. They called me one day down to booking, and it's the very end of how long they had to come get me. While I've been in CFCF, all type of you know stuff has transpired. CFCF is one of those places where fights jump off all day. If you've got any type of man in you, any type of buck, any type of you're not just gonna do whatever to me, you're gonna fight. It's just too many street dudes in there not to fight. A lot of fighting trans you know takes place in this it's three month period of time. You call me down to book him one day and it's a hey, I'm thinking I'm being released. The 90 day mark has got here. They didn't show up. These governor warrants, they gotta let me go. I ain't going to Virginia. They gonna have to hold off on them robbery charges. They didn't get here in time. We're all down there booking, waiting. Up. Some of these guys are being sent off to prison. Some are being released. Some are going to like halfway houses, different things. And I hear somebody say, what's a Chesterfield County? What is that? 
And when they said it, my heart sunk. Because I knew what it was. It was the county I caught my charges in. I look out. And I see a cop from where I live at. With another dude, which is a U.S. Marshal. And he's got a file in his hands. And he walks up to where we're at in the holding cell. And he says, Williams. And dude, it's another dude named Williams. He's like, what's up? He's like, no, nah, it's not you. This is a black dude. He's like, Jay Williams. I come to the front. What's up? We're here to pick you up. You're going back to Virginia. Uh, it's about to get worse. All right, man. So I step out. They take my shoelaces, other things, little just st stupid stuff, because I don't really have anything on me, right? Change me out of my clothes and put me into an inmate jumper that they had brought. It's an actual jumper that says inmate on it. That way, if I get free, I'm in all orange with inmate across the back. You can't mistake me. This ain't Halloween season. I, it is what it is. They take me down to where the buses are there to pick guys up and take them off to prison. And they've got this old grocery getter, one of those old, uh, one of those cars called the wooden panel cars, station wagons, with the big red leather plush interior. You sit on it, sit in it, and it's like sitting on a couch cushion. Thing was so comfortable, but it's embarrassing to ride in. Dudes are laughing. Oh shit, who riding in the grocery getter? I'm like, this can't be my ride. That's my ride. They put me in the back. U.S. Marshal drives, cop gets in the right seat. We head to Philadelphia International Airport. We get to the airport, and I'm thinking, all right, you know, whatever, they're going to put me on a plane. Ain't that simple. They put me on a single-engine Cessna. If you don't know what that is, Google it. It is a small plane. It's got two seats in the front, a little bench in the back, and a little tiny cargo area to, like, put boxes behind me. And inside this plane... There is a eye bolt. It's a bolt with a big circle on the top that goes to the floor. So all you see is this big circle on top coming up out the floor. Got the black box on me, which means I've got handcuffs on. I've got leg irons on. I've got a chain that runs around my waist that attaches to a black box that my hands then get locked inside this black box with a padlock. It put me inside the plane, which was extremely hard for me to get up in there because I've got leg irons on. And once I get in and sit down, they take a set of handcuffs and handcuff it to the shackles that are on my feet and then to the floorboard of the plane, which you know I spoke on. As soon as they got in and they started the plane up, I've never flown. So my first experience with flying is I'm being transported to another state with the police. I said, man, why y'all got to shackle my feet to the floor, man? What happens if this plane crashes? Well, they all know where to find you at. They don't want you going nowhere. I'm like, this is crazy. We take off. They give me some earplugs. I don't put the earplugs in. He's like, you might want to put those in. I'm like, I don't need these damn earplugs. I need to hear what's going on. I want to hear the, some noises get made, something clicks off. Not like I can do anything if the plane malfunctions. It just gives me peace of mind. We're in mid-flight, and I fall asleep. I wake up, I look down, I'm like, water is that? They're like, those are clouds. A couple minutes later, we land, Richmond International Air Airport, and they unload me and my ears. I can't hear anything from being up way in the air and that little ass plane with no, no earplugs in. They take me over to the jail, and they start their interrogation process. <sighs> Same thing I always do. Lawyer. Don't play these lawyer games with us. You're going to throw your whole life away. Do you really want to do this? You got a son at home. What happened? Lawyer. Look, man, maybe the dude owed you some money. We don't, they try to play these games with you. And no matter what you tell them, all they want you to do is admit that you were there. And then no matter why you tell them you were there, what happened, they're always going to spin the story to make you be the bad guy. And truth be told, I was the bad guy in the story. I ain't got nothing to say, man. You know what I mean? Give me a lawyer. I'm going to give you some time to think about what you're doing. Give me all the time in the world you want. You know what I mean? I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I'm just sitting there like, all right, whatever. They leave out the room. They come back in, and they sit a file down on the table. And he says, look, all this is you right here. 
I want you to take the ones, read through the file, the addresses, the places they occurred, and go ahead and pull the papers out, put them in a stack, the ones you're responsible for, for the robberies and stuff. And we're going to get this all cut into a deal. We're trying to help you. They're never trying to help you. They are trying to get a conviction and put your ass in prison as long as possible. I go ahead and slide the file away. I don't. I ain't robbed nobody, so I don't need to look through a file of robberies. I don't commit robberies. They leave me in this room for a long time. This time they leave, I don't know if they went home and took showers. Uh, I don't know what they did, but they left for a couple of hours. I'm sitting there with this file, and I'm looking through this file, and sure enough, I'm like, oh, man. I'm hit. That's what I'm thinking. They got all this stuff in a file. A lot of what I'm looking at, I'm responsible for. They come back in. I don't say nothing. What do you think about the file? It's got nothing to do with me, lawyer. Even after me saying lawyer, they're still trying their best to get me to talk. At the moment I said lawyer, they're not even supposed to say another word to me. But they continue and continue and continue. I ain't got nothing to say, man. Y'all wasting y'all's breath. Y'all can talk all day. I don't got nothing for you. I'm done here. Take me to my cell. They go ahead and process me in. Change me into that jail's jumpsuit. A couple days later, I go to Riverside, which is a regional jail. I sit in Riverside, better part of... I don't even know Seven, eight months I have been in front of the judge so many times Trying to get a bond And I can't get a bond And in the process of this I've told y'all stories of fights that happened in there And different things that happened But in the process of all this They're not giving me no bond There's no chance they're going to let me out on bond And they had to fly my ass back from Philadelphia To Virginia I done ran I'm known for running I'm going to take off on your ass I am not volunteering to be incarcerated. I'm not doing it. Especially when every time I catch a charge, it's something that's serious. Something that'll send your ass to prison unless you fight it, beat it, or come up with a plea deal. My lawyer comes to me one day and says, I got you a bond here. I said, man, you're wasting my time. Why are you even going to take me down there again for a bond hearing? Knowing that I'm not going to get bond. They're not going to give me a bond. Well, I'm hopeful this time. Some time has passed. You know, I think I can get you a bond. Whatever, we'll see. We'll get down there. 35000 Wait a minute, I have a bond? Just got your bond. Can you come up with 3500 Yeah, come up with 3500 I bond out that same night. Get up with my family and them for a little bit. And then I go to my homeboy's house, right? My homeboy, I didn't know at the time where he was working. He hadn't told me. Like, he just went to work every day, came in, and when the sun was coming up, he would come in. When the sun was going down, he would go to work. A couple different times, he's like, you want a job? And I'm like, nah, man, I'm just trying to live my best life before I go to trial. Trial is coming up now <clears throat> in about two months, a little less than two months. I see him coming every night, every morning, daylight. You know, first thing in the morning, I might be up all night drinking. He's counting ones. I'm like, what do you, wait tables for a living? He's like, nah, I'm a strip club DJ. What? He's like, yeah, I work at a strip club. I'm like, you should have been told me that. Like, yeah, I want a job. Like, what I got? I ain't, I ain't stripping, but what I got to do? He's like, we need bouncers. I said, all right, man. He's like, go up there and, you know, I'm going to put in a word for you. Go up there and talk to the manager. I go up there and talk to the manager, Derek. And he's like, you got any experience in bouncing? I said, I got experience in fighting. Um, you know, pretty smart dude. I know how to de-escalate a situation. All right, cool. You're hired. Hires me on as a bouncer, right? In the time working there as a bouncer, mind you now, I'm still out on bond. I know trial is coming up. I know that when I go to trial, I'm hit. They've got so much evidence, things they were telling me during that interrogation. They've got enough evidence to get a conviction, 100%. No matter what my lawyer says, unless it's Johnny Cochran, I'm going to prison. I meet this chick that works at the strip club. She's like the door girl. She's the one that when you come in, you show your ID to. Um, she gives you change. If you need ones to tip the girls with, you got a hundred, you bring it to her, she'll give you a hundred ones. 
I link up with her, start talking to her. Now I'm dating this, this you know, Puerto Rican girl that works at the door. Court is approaching and everybody, all the strippers in there, they love me. When I, when I mean love me, not on no sexual shit. I just, I did my job. If you wanted somebody out the club, get your ass over here. Get out. You know what I mean? Like, I did my job. Not to be too aggressive, but I did my job. I walked the girls in when they got there to make sure no stalkers were in the parking lot. I pulled their cars up to the door at the end of the night. So, because most of them come in with a bag, luggage, whatever, with their, their you know, clothes in it for the night. I'd have their cars running, the AC on. This is December by now. So the girls would tip me. There were nights I made $600 in tips from the girls, plus my shift pay. Court's approaching. By now, I'm not staying with my homeboy. I'm staying with another one of the bouncers at the club, renting a room from him. Court's getting here faster and faster and faster. I tell the girl, you know I'm probably going to have to go away. At the time, I didn't know how long I was facing. They had come to me with a bunch of different numbers, but I wasn't really sure of what it was going to be. So I never really told her, like, hey, I'm about to go away for a decade because I didn't know I was about to go away for a decade. Court rolls around. It's time to face the music. Them couple months that I was free prior to court was the most normal I had probably ever been in my life. During that period of time, I wasn't out breaking the law. I don't know. I think the change in me had already started, but it was too late. Too late for that now. I was spending as much time as I could with my son, which wasn't a lot, due to the fact that I was always at work. And in them, in them few, few short months of freedom, I just worked. Work, work, stack money, stack money, stack money. Court's coming. It's coming fast. I go pick my son up. I take him to this Mexican restaurant called Mi Hacienda. And I sit down with him and I do my best to explain to a two-year-old child, which my son's extremely smart and I'm blessed. He's 19 now, but I do my best to sit down and explain to a two-year-old child that I have to leave and go away. And prior to sitting down with him, I didn't plan on going to court. Let's keep it 100. I didn't. Prior to sitting down with him, I had every plan, every intention of running. I had talked to my friend Mikey's mom's boyfriend at the time. Rest in peace, Diane. She was with this Mexican guy named Ruben. Ruben had done time in Texas prisons, had done time in Mexico, I was always getting deported back because he was illegal. And Ruben had told me, I can get you into Mexico. And I'm thinking, bet. Mexico, here I come. You know what I mean? Hola, amigo. Like, que pasa? Like, what it do? I'm Mexican. Let me in this bitch. So he breaks down the whole process to me. What I'm going to have to do to get into Mexico. Where I'm going to have to go. How he keeps getting back into the United States. What path I got to take. Explains to me swimming across the Rio Grande and all this other shit. I'm like, all right. Then he starts telling me that where I'm going to be staying is dirt floors, big ass spiders. Like, there's no, the shutters on the windows, but no glass in the house. Um, no running water. And I'm like, mm, not the greatest idea, but. Definitely beats prison, whatever. I'll live in a porta john before I live in a cell. I'll live in an outhouse and let that be my home on the back of a farm somewhere if that means not going to prison. I was down for it. So Ruben's waiting here for me so we can get this process started of me bouncing from Virginia and going to Mexico. Sitting down with my son that night, trying to explain to this this child, this toddler. That he's not going to have a father no more. And as I'm talking to him, I'm not thinking about myself anymore. I'm thinking about him. I know that if I run to Mexico, the chances of my son ever having a father are zero. Because I'll never be able to return. As much as I want, I can't come back. And if I do come back, they're going to catch me. And then he's going to lose his dad a second time. 
explain to him that your dad has to go away. And that moment of sitting there talking to him, I made my mind up. I'm going to court. I want to be a dad. Even if it means it's 20 years from now, getting this started tomorrow puts me one day closer to being able to be his dad. Puts me one day closer to being able to be the man that I know I can be. I'm not going to run. I run it down to him. Look, your dad's got to go away. You be back tomorrow? No, I won't be back tomorrow. When you'll be back? I don't know. I'm not going to be back for a long time, but you need to understand that I love you and that one day I'll return. Where are you going? I did something bad, and I'm going to the place that people that make bad choices goes to. I tried to explain to him what prison was without getting too much into it. I let him know, always do good in life, love others, treat others good, don't do bad things because they have places just like this for little guys like you. But never, no matter what you hear, doubt that your dad loves you. You're going to hear bad things about me. As you grow up, you're going to hear people say I did this and I'd say I did that. And some of it's going to be true and some of it's not. But the one thing that is true is no matter what, I love you and I'll be back for you one day, I promise. Okay, Daddy, I love you too. We finish our dinner. Take him home. I give him a big hug. Takes everything in me to keep from breaking down. Because I know this kid is about to grow up with no dad. His father is... His dad is gone. There will be no father and son day at school. There will be no take your son to work day. Which plays a major part in why I take my kids to work now. That's all over with. Your dad's got to go to prison. After hugging him, he goes in the house. I leave... Me and a Puerto Rican chick go out that night and we go bar hopping. And I just get hammered. I am know I'm going. I'm getting locked up tomorrow. No way fans butts about it. I'm done for. Back into the clink I go. All night long, smoking weed, popping Xanax, popping Kalanabins. And I said I've been normal. I haven't been committing no crimes, but I haven't really been messing with the pills either. But this night, I'm like, this is my last free night. I'm about to turn up. I turn all the way up. I black out. Wake up the next morning with water being thrown on me. I'm like 30 minutes late to court. She can't get me up. I get up. I'm like, why you throw water on me? She's like, you got to go to court. And I'm like, I'm still groggy. I'm still drunk. I'm still high off the pills. Come on, hurry up. We got to go. Your mom is calling. We got to go. I'm like, I'm not going. You got to go. Let's go. All right, all right. Get your ass. Grab your stuff. I'm like, all right. I don't do what the normal person does. I get up, I put a pair of Thames on, a pair of black Sean John jeans, a black wife beater, big ass, dumb ass gold chain with a charm on it, grab a black fitted, throw it on, out the door I go. I'm going to court in a wife beater. You know, guys, for the minor and minor, smallest infraction, you go to court in a suit because you want to please the judge and look the part. I show up in a wife beater. Smoke a blunt on the way to the court. Shorty's tripping, like, why are you smoking in the car? Like, you're going to court like this, you're crazy. And, we get there, my mom's standing up top looking, because if you go into high court, they call it, like penitentiary, you go upstairs. Hurry up, hurry up, they keep calling your name. I stumble in sideways, reeking of liquor, reeking of weed, stumbling my words. I am trashed when I come into the courthouse. Make my way up the stairs, never gave the Puerto Rican chick a hug, never nothing. I need to just get into the courtroom real fast. As soon as I step in the courtroom because I'm late, they said, hey, detain him. Put that guy right there in cuffs and take him in the back. They had already started somebody else's case. They take me in the back. A little while later, they bring me out and they get my trial underway. Doesn't take them long to come back with a guilty verdict. My co-defendant pled no contest, meaning he knew they had enough evidence to convict him, but he wasn't pleading guilty. Me... I'm not guilty. I'm not pleading nothing. I'm, I'm going to fight it. I tried my best to fight it. And it just appeared real you know, real fast. It came clear to me that my lawyer was not doing his job. Guilty on both charges. Robbery, malicious wounding. Remanding back to, you know, into custody. Look at my people. Wave by. And off I go. As I'm sitting in the jail, things start to play across my mind. How did I get a bond? Why would they give me a bond? Knowing that I run, that I would most likely run, why would they give me a bond right at the end? It's not making sense. 
But there's another girl I used to mess with, and this is crazy that this actually happened, but she was bartending at the time. And the prosecutor that oversaw my case and my lawyer happened to come in and have drinks one night and she served them drinks and she overheard them talking about how I was pretty much traded for another guy to get off. Meaning my lawyer flopped my case. He failed my case intentionally. He failed me after taking my money, did not put up the best fight he should because him and the prosecuting attorney hadn't agreement. They had also violated what's called my speedy trial violation. Well, your speedy trial it means they have a certain amount of time from the date you're arrested to have you tried in front of a judge. They were literally coming up on that date and had they not either got me in front of the judge and had me tried if that hadn't happened I would have beat the charge on a technicality because they broke their own laws. The moment I make bail, that clock starts ticking again. It restarts. So my lawyer worked with them to get me a bail so that I couldn't beat the charges on a speedy trial violation, which was probably for the best. Three, four months later, it rolls around, and it's time for sentencing. I fired this lawyer, told him, you are fired. When he came and told me my high end was 27 years, my mid-range was 17 years and my low range was 10 years that he thinks he could get me the 17. I said, you are fired. You are not my lawyer. You didn't do anything for me at trial. You didn't defend me. You didn't say anything I said. And at this point, I didn't know about the deal. He had cut the prosecutor. This came to me after I'd fired him. I get a new lawyer. My new lawyer comes to me and says, hey, you didn't plead guilty, so they're not giving you no deal. There is no deal. You're at the mercy of the courts for whatever they're going to sentence you to. Anywhere between 27, 17, and 10. So, man, I'm done. I go in for sentencing. My mom and them is all there. Puerto Rican chick's not there. 10 years. Give my co-defendant eight. A couple weeks later, we come back for a sentence reduction. They knock my co-defendants down to six. And the victim in the case said, I don't think Brian should have to serve as much time as Jay. But Jay does not need to be released. Jay is just a scary individual. This is what was said. Um, I wasn't even the one that attacked him, but I did hold him. He's a scary individual. He shouldn't be released, but I do think you should give the other guy a sentence reduction. My co-defendant gets six years, I get 10. In the meantime, that relationship I had with the Puerto Rican chick is done. I had a homeboy that I bounced with at the time. Really good friends, man. We were really close. And I was calling her nightly. What's up, would you? Hey, what's good? Just checking in, man. Trying to tap in. I know I'm done. I know I'm locked up. And I call one night and I hear somebody in the background. I'm like, now who's in the background? It ain't Jody. But it is Jody. It's my homeboy. So what's he doing? Uh, he knows I'm upset, so he just came by to kick it with me after work. Do I have stupid on my forehead? No, a couple scars. Do not have stupid on my forehead. Next thing you know, the phone calls, she ain't answering no more. The letters, they stop. All that comes to a cease. I'm locked up, just been sentenced to 10 years, and she is now with one of my closest friends. So I'm dealing with the loss of my life as I once knew it. The fresh 10 year sentence I got, the girl I had that I was actually really good to while I was out, her being with one of my closest friends, a dude I kicked it with every day, a guy I worked with and bounced right beside that told me, I got you, Jay. I'll hold shit down. I'll make sure Shorty's okay while you're gone. She loves you. She's going to be there for you. We're going to be here for you. Don't worry about it. I got you. What I tell you about friends, man. After I get sentenced to the 10 years, and I've already, it's been three, four months since I went to trial. I get sentenced to this 10 years. I just don't care no more. That's when the worst I had to offer to the world really came into play. I came back from court. 
after that 10 year sentencing, after being betrayed by my homeboy, left by the girl, then lost a seven year relationship, life as I know it, my kids gonna grow up without me, off to the penitentiary I go for a decade, they got this file of robberies that I'm waiting to get indicted on any day now, I just feel like I have nothing to lose. Any and every little thing that happened while I was locked up, I took personal. It could be a facial expression, somebody walking too close to me, somebody saying something to somebody else. I just had this rage inside of me that I just, I couldn't release it fast enough. No matter how many fights I got into, how much pain I inflicted, how much pain I endured, I could not get this rage up off me. It was like, it was like it was eating me alive from the inside out. Like I was just, like there was a monster trying to crawl out of me and every time any little thing would happen, I would explode. So now in the jail, I find myself in the hole more than I am in general population. I get out of the hole and no sooner than I got out, I'd be in another fight and right back in the hole. I come into the pod and dudes already knew when I came in, like, oh man, Here comes this dude. I get shipped off to prison, right? I actually went to prison from the hole in the jail. They weren't playing with me. Me and dude get to fighting at the table. Bunch of his dudes bank me and I'm so angry and mad at the time that while they're banking me, it's not even registering that they're banking me. I'm on top of dude and I'm messing dude's ass up and his homeboys are pinging me all on the sides of my head. My homeboy Chris Peoples was my cellmate. Shout out to salute to you Chris Peoples for jumping in. He sees me getting banked. This is young, skinny white dude runs over there, fong, 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 starts fighting with these guys. Meanwhile, they're just tagging me in my head while I'm beating their homeboy up. I get to the hole, and I'm like, how all these knots come from, man? Huh? And he yells down. We're both in the hole. He yells down, damn, bro, you crazy. Like, I ain't never seen nothing like that. Like, them dudes was just pinging your ass up, and you was just eating it. I'm like, they was hitting me? He's like, man, they was jumping you. You ain't feel it? I'm like, nah, that was that rage in me. I go to receiving, receiving is a place you go prior to going to that, receiving is prison, but everybody starts off in receiving so they can classify you on what your custody level is according to what your points are, how many times you've been locked up, what offense are you in here on, how many times you've been in prison, how many felony convictions you got, are you violent, non-violent, all this is going to determine where you go, am I eligible for a work center or do I need to be medium max custody with me having robbery malicious wounding second go round, second robbery conviction second malicious wounding conviction there is no work center there is no low custodies I'm medium max my whole bit I go through receiving and I'm there a couple months and they shut this receiving unit down I was there like 40 some days and they did away with it so they emergency transferred all of us to wherever I had already talked to some of my homeboys in the jail. And they said, put him for Greensville. Greensville is penitentiary at its finest. Greensville is, it's violent. There's a lot of lifers there. There's a lot of people there, but you can actually do your time. You know what I mean? It's more like the streets than it is prison, except you're incarcerated and you're going to deal with some crazy dudes. You're going to deal with some crazy guards, but that's where you want to be. You don't want to be somewhere that you're locked down all day. I put him for Greensville. Doesn't take me long. As soon as I get to Greensville, same day I get to Greensville, I get jumped. I think I've talked on that in the past. I get jumped by fire danger and another one of their homeboys. Three dudes jump me on the basketball court. Welcome to Greensville. That's my introduction. From there, it was just a roller coaster of ups and downs. I get visits and I'd see my son. And then time would pass and I wouldn't have seen him in so long that every time I seen him, it was the same kid but it was like looking at a different kid because for me time was standing still I'm growing older he's growing older but I'm not there to see it you know when you're around your children every day you don't notice them growing up a couple years down the road you're like damn he's growing up fast when you don't see your kids for years at a time months at a time they grow up and you just see it when they show up I watched my son grow up in penitentiary visiting rooms and through visitation photos and photos that were sent to me. It's crazy. If I put them in order, you can almost flip them and like watch him grow up. The whole prison experience for years and years and years, I was just out of control 
all these whole trips, dealing with different guys, getting to know different guys and their stories and their reasons for being in there, different cellmates, different fights, different altercations. I had become so used to living in prison that that was my world. I couldn't picture being out here. I couldn't picture being in a car without being in the back seat in handcuffs. I started to lose grip of what it was to be free. I started to lose all grip of what the real world was and what reality was. The penitentiary had become my reality. Waking up for child, waking up when they blew the whistle, shakedowns, stabbings, fightings, booty bandits, nasty food, getting bucked on by a commissary, fighting people over two, three chips and a soda. That had become my everyday norm. Every now and then I jump on the phone call home on the holidays and I got to where I didn't even like to use the phone because every time I called home, somebody else was dead. I got tired of the bad news. We get to about a seven, eight year mark now. I'm in my 30s. 32, 33 years old. Actually, I'm like 31, 32 years old. 32, 33, something like that. And I really started to see a change in who I was. I wasn't doing all the things I was doing in the beginning of my bid. I wasn't running around selling drugs no more, trying to get drugs bought in. The fighting still happened, but it was more or less I'd do it when I had to and not just because I wanted to. I wasn't starting fights anymore. I remember the day things really started to change for me. And I know I've spoke on this, but I'm, I'm going to speak on it again because it was such a powerful moment for me. I used to sit on my bunk and just look out the window, watch the perimeter vehicles go around. Looking out this same window, I had seen a guy try to escape and get caught up in the razor wire. Looking out this same window, I'd watched them little Jeep Cherokees and trucks drive around the prison for years now. Years I've watched them go in circles. They do this 24 hours a day, making sure nobody's escaping. One's going this way and another one's going this way and they're just going in opposite directions. I'm looking out the window and I'm watching these trucks and I look out in this field past the, the fences and I learned to look past the fences. A lifer actually told me, stop looking at the fences and look past them. If you want to get out there and do something with your life, you need to stop focusing on this and start focusing on what's out there. And I could see the deer out there in the field and all I could think is, I don't even have the same freedom or privilege that a wild animal has. That is what you have done to yourself, Jay. You can't even, you can't even walk outside if you want to. You're the animal. Look at you. The real animals, what's supposed to be the real animals, they're out there free. Look at you. This whole time I've worked maintenance, I've done all these different things, made wine, fought, just being locked up. They shipped me to a place that's a TC, therapeutic community for my last two years and I was less than two years at this point I was not ready for where they sent me to not on the aspect of violence not on the aspect of anything you would think but this place they want you to sit in chairs for certain hours of the day listen to people talk it's still prison talk about yourself do all these groups to try to get to the root of why you are the way you are. They figured I was a perfect candidate for this. I needed this re-entry. I needed this therapeutic community. And a lot of it had to do with my prison conduct, my charges on the streets. You look at my prison file, you're like, yeah, this guy needs to go there. And we need to try to change him before he gets out. The dorm setting was the biggest problem for me. Put me in a cell any day, lock the door. At least I can escape and get some sense of privacy, some sense of peace of mind. When you're in a dorm, there's never any peace of mind, except when you're asleep and it's kind of like you're half sleep. You don't fully sleep because you got people walking around you, people going to the bathroom all night, walking past your bunk, fights jumping off, people up all night watching TV, people laughing, people in the back rapping. You just got a lot going on around you at all given moments. And this was also a YO camp, youthful offenders. 
So they had a lot of juveniles, juveniles, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old that had been sent here as a type of diversion. Complete this program, and instead of doing five years, you can be out as early as a year and a half, two years. Mess up the program, off the prison with the big boys you go. There's a lot of teenagers there, and that shit drove me nuts. Like, putting me around kids all day when I'm used to being around lifers and hardened criminals. Majority of the guys here ain't been locked up as long as me. Most of the guys here don't have violent charges. I'm not understanding why I'm here, so I'm bucking. The old me is back. You know what I mean? The guy I tried to let go of in that other prison is back. Like, I ain't standing for none of this dumb shit. Don't nobody know me here. So it's like you're starting all over again. I got to prove myself all over again. The fighting starts all over again. I'm sitting in the hole. A shout out and salute to Patricia Collins. She runs the program up there. And she comes back there and she talks to me. <coughs> Excuse the cough, man. I'm sick. My family's sick. No, it's not COVID. We've been tested. It's like the flu or something. So I've been coughing. She comes back there once on one of my whole trips and has these long conversations with me on changing the way I think and trying to get to the root of my issues. I never knew I had an issue. I never knew why I was, you know, why I was so angry. After we really got into it and we broke it down, we got into the the underlying reason for it all. It all stemmed from my father. It all stemmed from the not having any closure. From the anger that I had pent up towards him that I never released. That just continued to grow. Anger is like a, it's like a fire. You know, it starts off with just a little bit. And then as more gets added to it and nothing happens, you don't get to release it. It just starts to rage out of control. And that's what I had in me. I had a fire that was just raging out of control. You know, it was almost like, like there was someone else living inside of me at times. She told me, I want you to write a letter to your dad. And I remember when she told me this, I'm thinking, this woman is batshit crazy. Like, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. She's got the brain of a broken Oreo, a soggy Cheeto, uh, you know, an ashtray full of water. This woman is stupid. But I took the time to listen to her. Ain't like I had anybody else to listen to. I'm in the hole. I want you to write this letter to your dad. And when you get out the hole, I want you to go somewhere where there's nobody else. Where the hell am I going to go? Go out on the wreck yard. Find your corner. Sit down by yourself where it's somewhat quiet. Read the letter out loud and then destroy it. I'm thinking, yeah, this 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 woman's she's stupid. They, you know what I mean? She done tricked these people and got this job. Like, I don't know where they do that at, but that's some of the dumbest shit I've ever heard. I sat in that cell writing that letter to my dad. And as I was writing the letter, the tears just started pouring. One of the few times I can remember I cried in prison. As I'm writing this letter, I'm so angry, but I realized that a lot of my anger isn't anger. A lot of my anger is pain. A lot of what I've got built up inside of me had created the perfect storm. All the different emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, resentment, regret, all that piled together made me this this monster that I had become inside. It's like a five page letter front and back that I wrote. And I, I remember the whole entire time I was writing the tears were just running, running, running. Like, like my eyes were like faucets. Like I could not stop crying to the point I was sobbing while reading, you know, writing this letter. I fold the letter up, put it with my other stuff. They released me from the hole, come out, I go in the wreck yard and I sit down and I read the letter out loud. That was a way of me getting out what I had inside. I never knew I had a problem. I knew I had a problem being a criminal in anger, but I didn't know why. After I was done, I ripped the letter up, walked over to the drain and dropped the letter in the drain. Eyes were all swollen from crying, red cheeks were all puffy. Stayed to myself for a little while because I didn't want anybody to know I'd been crying. And I really started focusing on myself, who I needed to be when I came home. I started questioning, who is Jay Williams? Why am I here? What is my purpose? This can't be life. 
There's got to be more than this. I can't get out and do this no more. I'm tired of this. My son is, at this point, I'm about to come home. My son is 12. I want to be a dad. I want to be a man. I want to be normal. I want to go home. I want to start a construction company. I want to talk to people and I want to change people's lives. This will not all be in vain. I will have not went through all this and done all this in life for nothing. I will go home. I will make it out of here. I will never return to being the person I was. I will never return to a box. I'm not an animal and I'm not this person that I've been acting like and pretending to be all these years. Let it go, Jay. Let it go. I did my best to let it go. Do I still struggle with the anger that I have? Sometimes, yes. Do I act on it? Absolutely not. Is it bottled up like it used to be? No. Shortly before I'm released and during my bid, off and on, I've been talking to this girl that I've met prior to going to prison. That's the girl I told you that was actually a bartender at the time. She was in and out of my life during my bid. Shortly before my release, I cut her off completely. There were some things I heard that I couldn't deal with. And I'm not going to say she was my girl during my bid because I was by myself. I didn't have no girl. She would come and go, but she started showing up more at the end. I cut her off and I meet the woman that is now my wife. I would not entertain the thought or idea of a relationship while incarcerated. And it went bad for me so many times that I knew better. I learned this back when I was a, a teenager and Misa left me for booger. You know what I mean? When I was just a, a young guy in the detention center and my little childhood girlfriend left me for a guy named Booger. <laughs> God, you can't make this shit up. Throughout jail beds, I'd been left. You know, I knew not to have no relationship. Puerto Rican trick, chick, the Puerto Rican chick had me convinced that I was okay. She could handle that. Her and that guy went on to have a kid together, get married. I don't know what's going on now. But I meet the woman that would ultimately become my wife. Kind of express to her that, you know, I'm not in no position to be in no relationship. I can't be having you come up here kissing me in my mouth, not knowing what you was doing with your mouth last night. I've been in here a while. I know what girls do when they leave up out of here. You know what I mean? Like, come on now. No, nah, I ain't having it. But it did happen. At this point, I was getting out in about eight months. I met her October 2013, and I was released July 10th, 2014. I'm getting closer and closer to the door and I'm starting to, when I mean getting close to the door, I mean I'm about to be released. I'm at a point now where I'm not really talking to people. I'm trying to stay to myself. Right before I'm released, I I guess you could say intentionally went to the hole. I just needed a break. I needed to get away from everybody. Now, a lot's transpired in this short period of time. From the time I've met her to where I'm about to go home. She's coming to see me once, twice a month, sometimes three times a month. About an hour and a half trip from, you know, our city to this city. I've gotten comfortable. I'm getting attached. I've got emotions. I told myself I wouldn't catch feelings. But like Eminem said, with time spent, emotions grow. The emotions started to grow. That whole love thing started to happen. Here I am. I'm right at the gate. I'm right at the end, get into it in the visiting room with a guard. He's accusing her of bringing drugs in. This is a girl that won't even take prescription medication. Never done any hard drugs. Hit a blunt one time in her life and thought she was going to have a heart attack and has never smoked ever since. But she's being accused of bringing in drugs just because the guard doesn't like me. There was no truth to it. Right hand to God, there was no truth to it. I was done with that lifestyle. She wouldn't have agreed to nothing like that to begin with. And I never, after I'd already been locked up, while locked up, for having drugs bought in, years and years and years ago, seven, eight, nine years ago, that had already happened to me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not stupid. I tell her, don't come back up here. This is my prison. You don't have to be here. 
I'll be home soon enough. Just be there when I get there, right? I'm sitting on the phone one day, talking to her, and the guards come up and tell me, Williams, you're moving. Moving where? You're moving over to six building. Six building is where you go home when you're within like 60 days, 90 days, something like that. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not moving. I wanted to go to the hole. I needed time to myself. I needed time to think and really take in the fact that these people, I'm about to leave. You're really going to let me go after all this time. It's been 10 years and y'all are like, just going to let me go. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't believe it. I need to work on myself. I'm not moving. What? I'm not moving. Look, the building you're going to, <coughs> you have a lot more privileges. It's a lot more laid back. You'll like it over there better. Just move. I'm not moving. Williams, don't make us lock you up, man. We don't want to take you to hold. Come on, please. Just, they didn't say please. Sir, please, you know, put your stuff in the bag and just move over to six building. Nah, I'm not moving. Just, I wanted to go to the hole. She's, what's going on? I said, I'm about to go to the hole. Why? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I don't know. You got to have a reason. Oh, yeah, they're locking me up because I'm not. I'm refusing to move. Why don't you just move? At the time, I didn't know. I don't know. I bought. They locked me up. Patricia Collins returns to my cell again. Lord knows how many times I've been in the hole now. We have more conversations. But it wasn't about the conversations at this point. It was just about me needing to be alone. Me needing me time. Me needing silence. I sat and I reflected on everything. I ran down my life in like a timeline. From as far back as I could remember. I started going over everything. I had so many emotions, so many memories, so many bad memories that I was trying to come to terms with, plans for the future. And right then and there in my head, I set what you are now watching into motion. I gathered my plan on what I was going to do as far as construction. I actually thought I would end up being an any inner city youth counselor, or I would go back and start speaking with kids or going into prisons. I thought that would be how I got my point across. I knew my chances of being in music were shot because nobody wants to hear, you know what I mean, a white rapper in his mid thirties that's been in prison for over a decade. And you got these dudes that are 19, 20 years old popping on the scene like that's dead. But the music, I was great. I was great at what I did because just like what I do here, I was great at storytelling, expressing myself, all that. I really thought I was going to be a counselor. I thought that I would be somebody that made a living counseling. And oddly enough, I do. I didn't even know what a YouTube was. I didn't know what an app was. I didn't know what none of that stuff was when I got out. Stay tuned for part three. I'm headed towards the gate. My stuff is packed. Part three is going to pick up from that day until up to now so in today's video the second part was more about my journey it's more about self discovery growing into who I actually was overcoming the things I've been through there was so much that happened in that 10 year period I just covered 10 years in an hour so much happened but y'all can watch all the other videos to put that together. Y'all can use y'all's imagination on 10 years in prison. It's the things that people don't tell you that you need to hear. Like the stuff with writing that letter. The time to yourself. The getting to the root of your issues and overcoming who you used to be. That's the important part of part two. Well, part three, we're going to get into a lot of the struggles I had when I got out. Struggles I had with myself and learning to be normal y'all saw my brother on camera the other day i felt the same exact way i felt crazy being free like like this is insane like i was more used to being around guys with knives and watching people bleed that was normal to me 
standing in 7-Eleven getting a big gulp and a hot dog scared me to death. It's crazy how those things happen. And here we are today. But anyway, these jails, penitentiaries, these prisons, these facilities, they're all just crazier worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones. And there are some real ones out there. Because y'all still watching me. And y'all know how we do. Salute.